It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I table for the information of the Senate a revised ministry list. In doing so, I congratulate Senator McKenzie on her reappointment to the ministry. I seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard and make a short statement, which I just did. Leave granted. Leave is granted. No. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I advise the Senate that the updated ministry list reflects the updated ministry announced by the Prime Minister on 2 July 2021. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question for Minister Colbeck. Isn't he remoting in for Mr. question Senator time? Colbeck I assume he is. Attending remotely. I'm yes, I'm here, Senator. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Senator Wong. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Why did Mr Morrison repeatedly tell Australians that getting vaccinated is, and I quote, not a race? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Colbeck, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, uh, giving the opportunity for all Australians to access a vaccin vaccination is extremely important. The Prime Minister has continuously uh, reinforce that, Mr. President. Mr. President, we have, uh, as we said, we would continued to accelerate the vaccine rollout uh, as more vaccines became available, and we've continued to open up the number of uh, uh, access points for vaccine in conjunction with the states uh, with the growth in vaccine supply, Mr. President. As of uh, the last week, Mr. President, we've vaccinated in excess of. Uh, one million Australians in the last week. Uh, in fact, we've vaccinated more than one million order. Australians over the last three Se weeks. Senator Colbeck, so Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. A point of order is direct relevance. I asked a very simple question of the Minister representing the Minister for Health as to why the Prime Minister repeatedly told Australians that getting vaccinated wasn't a race. Let you remind the minister of the question. It was quite specific. As long as the minister is specifically talking about the vaccine rollout, I don't believe I can instruct him how to answer the question. I'm listening carefully, um, and I've reminded the minister of that. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, as I said at the outset in my response to Senator Wong's question, the Prime Minister has repeatedly reinforced the importance of Australians getting vaccinated. That is at the heart of the four-point plan that the government has released in conjunction with the state through National Cabinet to allow Australians to have more access to freedoms as we increase the vaccination rollout. Mr President, the Prime Minister has always, has always reinforced the importance of vaccination order. and will continue to Senator do so. Colbeck, Senator Wong on a point of order. Well, I raise the direct relevance point again. Um, I anticipate what your ruling will be. I will ask you perhaps to go away and get advice on the clerk, for the clerk as to whether simply mentioning vaccinated means that your test of direct relevance being any discussion of vaccine rollout meets the relevant test. I will happily seek advice from the clerk um, on the direct relevance test. Um, I just remind senators and the minister that a narrow question requires a narrow answer, but I do not believe I can instruct him the terms on which. But I'll come back to the chamber. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, um, the Prime Minister has at all times, has at all times stressed the importance of vaccination. He continues to do so. It is extremely important that as many Australians get vaccinated as possible. The government has worked to continue to increase supply and the number of access points to allow Australians to get vaccinated. And we'll continue to do that. We've released the data to advise Australians on the availability of vaccine over the course of this year. And of course, the four point plan that was, re that was uh, worked through through National Cabinet is all about getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible so we can allow more freedoms to Australian people. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you. Supplementary question. The Prime Minister has repeatedly said that the vaccine rollout is not a race, and his own backbench has admitted that, and I quote, he shouldn't have said that. With millions of people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland as we speak, and tragically 15 deaths from COVID-19 this year in Sydney, does the government regret Mr Morrison's repeated statements that the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister can and has spoken for himself with respect to this matter. But as I said to the Chamber in relation to uh, this question, the Prime Minister has always reinforced the importance of vaccination. The government has continued to reinforce the importance of vaccination, and we will continue to do so. We know that getting a high proportion of Australians vaccinated uh, is one of the paths out of this pandemic. If you look at the circumstances in international uh, uh, jurisdictions, we see that the pandemic is becoming one of those who are not vaccinated. The, the importance of vaccination is clearly, is clearly extremely important. The Prime Minister continues to reinforce the importance of vaccination and getting Australians vaccinated as soon as possible, and the government will continue to work uh, to ensure that that's possible. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. With around 10 million people in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, can this minister explain why it has taken so long for Mr Morrison to go from it's not a race to we're making a gold medal run? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, I think Senator Wong misrepresents the words of the Prime Minister that uh, he put in his opinion piece earlier in the week. He was talking about the spirit of the Australian people working to getting vaccinated and, and understanding what the targets were uh, for Australians to be va vaccinated so that they could enjoy more freedoms. Uh, we make no apology for that. It, it only reinforces the point that Australians need to get vaccinated. Uh, we continue to increase the capacity of the vaccine rollout. And as I said earlier, uh, over, over a million people vaccinated in the last two weeks. The vaccination process is doing what we said it would do. It's continuing to roll to, to increase pace as we increase supply and capacity. And we continue to increase the number of outlets that are available for Australians to access the vaccine. Uh, we pay particular attention to those areas of the country that are under stress, like New South Wales, uh, and we'll continue order, to Senator do that. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Back, Senator, order, Senator, Col Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please advise the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is implementing its plan to transition Australia from the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger and more secure nation? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Brockman for his question and I know his enduring uh, work and interest in relation to uh, Australia, seeing through the short-term challenges and immediate challenges our nation faces, uh, but also the importance of continuing to build a stronger and more secure Australia in the long term. Uh, our immediate focus as a government continues to be dealing with the immediate health and economic crises, but also setting out a pathway through that uh, to the return of more normal life. It's built on the clear premise that by getting people vaccinated, and we can make uh, current approaches to lockdowns or border closures and restrictions ultimately a thing of the past, not necessarily eliminating safeguards and precautions that have to be taken in relation to infectious diseases, but being able to move forward. Just last week, the National Cabinet agreed in principle to our updated four-step plan to chart our path out of the pandemic and the targets we need to reach to get there. It is a uniquely Australian plan based on clear medical, scientific and economic evidence. Today we've shared that expert advice from the Doherty Institute and the Commonwealth Treasury with Australians. It's a plan that gives every Australian a goal to work towards as a way out of this pandemic. It ensures that as we get through each phase that we need to reach the vaccination target on average as a country and for each state and territory, we also know the different steps that can be taken in changed management approaches to COVID-19 while still keeping Australians safe. For example, once we get 70 per cent of eligible Australians vaccinated, we move to the next phase where lockdowns will be less likely, restrictions can be eased and many freedoms returned. Those steps enhance even further at the 80 per cent stage, as the Doherty Institute evidence outlines. Australia is in a unique position amongst many nations of the world, having had the ability to work through such an expert scientific approach that can enable us uh, to work through our vaccine rollout continue to manage the pandemic 
in ways that can best position our country Order. for the future. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister out please outline the supports the government has put in place, including with the states and territories, to support Australians and businesses affected by lockdowns? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the immediate challenges remain real for many Australians, particularly those facing lockdowns in Greater Sydney, in South East Queensland and others uh, along the way. Uh, we're directly delivering financial support to impacted individuals and to businesses. Be people who have lost more than 20 hours of work in the previous week during a lockdown can claim $750. People who have lost between eight hours or a full day of work to 20 hours can claim $450. These are equivalent levels of support that we provided with JobKeeper last year, but in a more targeted, tailored program uh, that can effectively reach those who need it most. Uh, in fact, it's a program that Premier Dan Andrews has likened uh, to being uh, an updated version of JobKeeper. Individuals who currently receive an income support payment through our social security safety net will also receive an additional weekly payment of $200 if they have lost more than eight hours of work, whilst we have plans operations in place with states and territories in relation to cost sharing support for small and medium sized businesses, all of it designed to help ensure we get people through these Order. difficult times and they come back strongly Senator afterwards. Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please update the Senate on the progress of the vaccination rollout and the steps the government is taking in cooperation with the states and territories as part of the national roadmap? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, I want to thank uh, the millions of Australians who are turning out to get vaccinated. Uh, with numbers growing each and every day, we now know that around 12.6 million doses have been administered across Australia and more than a million doses a week are being administered. And we've acknowledged there were early challenges to the program in terms of uh, expected deliveries that didn't arrive, uh, in terms of changes in advice from medical experts, uh, but nonetheless we're now seeing a total of 4.5 million vaccinations administered last month, which is more than double what was achieved in May, when 2.1 million doses were administered. This steady increase in supply, coupled with a steady increase in distribution outlets, is ensuring that we have the strongest possible position uh, for Australians to be able to get vaccinated, uh, to know that the supply will be there for them, the outlets for them, and that we can reach the 70 and 80 per cent targets outlined by the Doherty Institute uh, to safely Order. proceed to Senator the next stages Birmingham. of pandemic management. Senator Keneally, remotely. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. In late June, the Prime Minister said in response to the Delta COVID-19 outbreak in Sydney, and I quote, I commend Premier Berejiklian for resisting going into a full lockdown. Does the Morrison government stand by this commendation? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and can I say I do commend New South Wales for the work that they've done in managing COVID-19. Clearly, throughout the pandemic, they've done an exceptional job. The Delta variant, however, has presented a, a range of new parameters for us to deal with. It moves much more quickly. Uh, and as we've learned more, more about it, it's been clear using the health advice and the scientific evidence that we've had to change our approach. The New South Wales government and the Prime Minister have both acknowledged that. Uh, and the government will continue to adapt its approach to COVID-19 uh, as we meet all of the challenges that come towards us through the pandemic, as we have done through the pandemic so far. But, as has been said on a number of occasions, there is no rule book to this pandemic. Uh, we know that new variants will come uh, and they will change the way that we have to approach the pandemic. Uh, and we will continue to meet those challenges, Mr President. Australians can be confident of that. But the thing that we need to concentrate on right now is to continue to increase the pace of the vaccine rollout. That's where the government's focus is. That's why we've released the plan that we have to allow the economy to reopen. That's why we're increasing the number of uh, points where Australians can access uh, vaccine. And that's why we're working with the New South Wales government to increase the capacity in those areas of concern in New South Wales, Mr. President. Uh, we will continue to do that. We will continue to meet the challenges that this pandemic throws up 
to us all. Uh, we'll continue to support Australians uh, as they need to be supported, Mr. President, uh, and we'll continue to increase the capacity of Australians to get um, access to a vaccine because we know that is one of the uh, most important pathways towards a more normal life for all Australians. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As a result of Mr. Morrison's bungled vaccine rollout, the Business Council of Australia has estimated that the Sydney lockdown is costing the economy $257 million a day. Does the Morrison government regret supporting a delayed lockdown in Sydney? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Morrison government will continue to act on the health advice in support of the management of this pandemic. We will continue to work with the states and territories to support them with their management of the state of the pandemic, as we have done all the way through through the formation of National Cabinet and the decisions that have been made there, Mr. President. Uh, the advice that we've received uh, in respect of both the management of the current outbreak in Sydney with the Delta variant is that uh, the lockdown is appropriate. Uh, it needs to be uh, appropriately managed because of the speed at which the Delta variant works. Uh, and of course, having an appropriate management of the uh, local community and the lockdown also brings with it uh, or removes the possibility of longer lockdowns, uh, and which will have a, an even worse economic outcome. So, Mr. President, order. Uh, we Senator will continue Colbert, to work. Time for the answer Australia has expired. Sen order on my left, Senator O'Neill, Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Mr. Morrison's mismanaged vaccine rollout has tragically led to the deaths of 15 people from COVID-19 in Sydney. Will the Morrison government apologise for Mr. Morrison's wrong advice to the New South Wales Premier and for failing to protect the people of Sydney from this devastating COVID-19 outbreak? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I simply do not accept the allegation that's been put forward by Senator Keneally in her question. The decisions with respect to lockdown in New South Wales are decisions of the New South Wales government. They have responsibility for those matters uh, under their public health responsibilities. It is absolutely tragic that we've lost a further 15 lives to this current outbreak, uh, to this new variant. Uh, and I extend my condolences to every one of those families uh, that, uh, that are involved in that loss of life. But Mr. President, the suggestion that uh, the vaccine rollout is responsible for this current outbreak is simply not true. Uh, Mr. President, I reject completely the premise of the question that's been put Order, Parliament Senator Colbeck. Senator. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. We are going to another question. Senator Seawit remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Minister, the Prime Minister's press conference on the modelling by the Doherty Institute leaves a lot of unanswered questions, showing only a set of slides. Will the government release the modelling for, by the Doherty Institute in its entirety, including any technical papers and reports? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. My understanding is, uh, and I don't, I don't have a, a brief on this with me, unfortunately, um, Mr President, but my understanding is that we, it is our intention to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, so um, I, I can't give any further advice uh, with respect to the technical papers, but my understanding is that it is the government's intention to increase, uh, to release the modelling from the Doherty Institute so that Australians can understand the rationale behind the decisions that are being made as a part of the uh, plan to reopen the economy. 
Senator Seawood, a supplementary question. Thank you. Could the minister take that on notice, please, and confirm if the technical reports will also be uh, released? Can I, uh, can I ask also, the government is aiming for 70 per cent of the adult population to be vaccinated for stage B, for phase B, which actually equates to 56 per cent of the entire population. If we start leaving, leaving, lifting restrictions at around that range, the Grattan Institute predicts there could be close to a million cases of COVID. Have you looked at the Grattan Institute's Order, model Senator and Seward, are you concerned? The time for the question has expired. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm happy to take on notice the part of the question that I wasn't able to answer or send to see what previously with respect to supplementary work. Mr President, the government has made its decisions based on the modelling from the Doherty Institute. Uh, the, the, that modelling is based on those people who are currently um, part of the recognised vaccine rollout. So, Mr President, uh, I, I haven't seen the paper that's been done by um, the Grattan Institute, Mr President, but the government uh, through National Cabinet, commissioned the Doherty Institute to do the research that was required to um, provide the benchmarks for opening the economy. Uh, I've indicated that uh, it's the government's intention to release that institute, uh, that, in that information, Mr President, and that information is based on the current parameters of the Order, vaccine Senator rollout. Senator Colbeck, time for the answers expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. The TGA has approved the use of Pfizer in children aged 13 and, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 12 and over. Children are essential, an essential part of any vaccine strategy. Why didn't you include children over 12 years of age in your vaccination targets and are you going to? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, thank, thank you, Mr President. Mr President, uh, that information, from my understanding, will be uh, included in the data from the Doherty Institute that is being released publicly so that Australians can understand uh, what's, uh, what, what, is the, what the basis is for the targets that have been set. Uh, bearing in mind, Mr President, uh, that it's only in recent times that there has been a, an approved vaccine in Australia uh, for um, children between the age of 12 and 16. Uh, the um, Pfizer uh, vaccine is now approved for children, uh, and my understanding is that the data being submitted to the Australian government for the Moderna vaccine likewise is seeking approval for children, um, uh, for those over the age of 12. So, Mr President, uh, all that information will be available once the Doherty information is released, and I understand it's being released Order, very soon. Senator Colbeck. We'll move to Senator Griff remotely. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Last week, Rosa Mayoni pleaded guilty to killing Anne Marie Smith. Ms. Smith was an NDIS participant in Ms. Maloney's care, but suffered extreme neglect. She ultimately died in what South Australian police described as disgusting and degrading circumstances. Ms. Smith's death led to an independent review known as the Robertson Review which reported in August last year and made 10 recommendations. Minister, how many of these recommendations does the government support and how many have been implemented to date? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator very much for his interest in this case. Uh, it is now more than a year since the absolutely tragic death of Anne-Marie Smith. And can I say no Australian, no Australian should ever have to die the way this lady did. Uh, and the death does continue to sadden and shock many people across Australia. As the Senator has said, in August 2020, the support worker alleged to have been providing support to Ms Smith was arrested by the South Australian police, charged and has now pleaded guilty. In May 2020, the NDIS Commissioner appointed the Honourable Alan Robertson uh, SC to conduct an independent review into the NDIS Commission's 
uh, regulation of integrity care, the provider concerned. And the review was publicly made available on the 4th of September 2020. In August 2020, the NDIS Commission revoked the registration and issued a banning order against Integrity Care, the provider of support to Ms Smith. In addition to this, the Commission has taken a number of other regulatory actions in relation to Integrity Care and to Ms Smith's former support worker. In relation to the Robertson Review itself, uh, the Government is fully supportive of the review and all its recommendations. And in fact, we have a bill in this place uh, at the moment, which the Community Affairs Committee is currently uh, taking evidence on. So we are absolutely and resolutely committed to delivering quality and safe NDIS services to all participants to meet their needs, but also to support them to live free from violence, from abuse, from neglect, and also from uh, exploitation. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. One review recommendation, Minister, was for the NDIS to establish a community visitor scheme. Now, that would allow vulnerable participants to have face-to-face -face contact of an independent person who can ensure that they are being cared for and their rights respected. Now, a similar scheme already exists for older Australians receiving home care packages. When will the government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you again, uh, Senator, for that uh, question. Uh, this is an issue that I'm very familiar with, and the South Australian Minister has also raised this issue directly with me uh, for obvious reasons. It is something that I'm hoping that the Community Affairs Inquiry will also uh, look into, and I understand that they did take evidence in relation to this issue, in relation to the balance between the right of privacy versus the right of entry and how to deal with that situation. So I very much look forward to the Community Affairs Report uh, on the legislation. But we clearly have to get the balance right between a, a person's right to privacy uh, in their own home and also how we ensure that they are best protected. Senator Griff, final supplementary question. Minister, the review also recommended each vulnerable participant have an individual within the NDIS who is responsible for their safety and well-being, a single point of contact, if you like, when things go wrong. Will the government implement this recommendation? And I don't think we need to, to wait for any other inquiry or community affairs review of any type. Will government implement this recommendation? And if not, why not? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, and I thank Senator Griff for that uh, question. Uh, in relation to that matter, it is something that I'm seeking further advice from the NDIA on and also the Commission. Because again, it's uh, like many things with the NDIA, you move one lever and it actually impacts other aspects uh, of the implementation of the scheme. So, Senator Griff, I'll take that aspect on notice and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. The Prime Minister has announced that Australia will enter its next phase out of the pandemic when 70 per cent of the adult population is vaccinated. On what date will this target be reached? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I'm looking on the screen. Thank you, Mr President. Yep. Well, Mr President, the government deliberately has not established a date for that to occur because that particular matter is in the hands of Australians. But what we will do is continue to encourage Australians to come out and get vaccinated. And, what, and, and we will also continue to increase the number of avenues that they can access a vaccination. Uh, and we have continued to do that, Mr. President. Uh, as we've had access to more vaccine, we've increased the number of avenues for Australians to get vaccinated, whether that be through state clinics that we were operating, uh, we're supporting the states by provision of, of vaccine, whether it's through the GP respiratory clinics that are now providing uh, vaccination Order. services, whether, whether it's through the GPs who are doing a magnificent job, Mr President, of uh, providing vaccines for Australians, or by growing the number of access points across the country through pharmacy, Mr President. So we will continue to provide access to Australians 
to the vaccine and we'll continue to increase the number of uh, outlets available uh, as we continue to Senator grow the supply. Um, Senator O'Neill. Well, Mr. President, we haven't uh, deliberately uh, put a date on that. We want Australians to come out and get vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, and the point of setting the targets, using the advice of the Doherty Institute, is so that Australians understand the thresholds that are required for them to enjoy more freedoms and for the country to continue to work to its way through uh, this pandemic, Mr. President. Uh, it would be, it is not the right thing for us to, to, to attempt to set a date for this, Mr. President, uh, but we will continue to do everything we can to encourage Australians to access a vaccine. Senator Watt, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Don't the 10 million people who are now in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland, who have been let down by Mr Bro Morrison's broken promises, deserve to know when this target will be reached? Isn't being up front with 10 million Australians in lockdown the Australian way? Order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I don't accept the characterisation that's been placed on this matter by Senator Watt at all. Australians all understand the importance of beating this pandemic, of beating this virus, but they also understand that they have a choice to come out and get vaccinated. What we will continue to do is to encourage them to do so, by providing them with good advice with respect to the vaccines. And what we'll also continue to do is to increase the number of points that are available to them to access the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. The important thing is to uh, ensure that Australians understand, understand the targets that are there to allow us more freedoms under the transition plan that's been announced uh, and worked on through National Cabinet very cooperatively and to provide opportunity for Australians to both access Order, Senator and receive Colbeck. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Morrison government's own COVID response plan includes measures, and I quote, encouraging uptake through incentives. Why is the Morrison government prepared to publicly consider discounts and frequent flyer points, but ruled out any other direct financial incentives? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, uh, we've ruled out the plan that's been put in, that's been announced by the leader of Order. the opposition, uh, because it's a bad plan, Mr. President. Order. Um, as it was described to me this morning, Mr. President, all thought and no, uh, all bubble and no thought, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, we will do what we need to do uh, Order. to Sorry, encourage Senator Australians. Colbert, please um, pause for a moment. Pause the clock. I appreciate the chamber is robust. I'm just actually struggling to hear Senator Colbeck. We do need to change our regular behaviour and be a touch more compliant with standing orders about interjections during a remote session. I appreciate the chamber is more quiet than normal, but the chamber needs to be especially quiet because I need to be able to hear the answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, so, Mr. President, we will continue to encourage Australians to come forward and take a vaccine. Uh, part of the reason that we set the four-point plan out was so that Australians understood what the thresholds were to enjoy more freedoms. So we will continue to support them by providing greater access to vaccines through both supply and access points, Mr President, because we know that all Australians understand the importance of uh, getting a vaccine so that we can all enjoy more, more freedoms uh, and, and get on top of this pandemic. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. As we continue to battle the COVID-19 pandemic, many people are becoming increasingly affected by their inability to work because of lockdown and movement restrictions. Can the minister please outline what financial support the Liberal and Nationals government is providing to people who've lost hours of work in areas who are currently locked down, including Commonwealth hotspots in and around Sydney? 
The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the Senator for her question and her uh, advocacy and passion for her home state of New South Wales. And I think everyone in this chamber uh, stands with those that are experiencing a lockdown in New South Wales right now. Well, COVID-19 has had an unprecedented impact, not just in Australia, but around the world. More than four million lives have been lost, and we're facing the largest global imp economic impact since the Great Depression. Order. In the face of a once-in-a-century pandemic, the Australian spirit has shone through. Early and decisive actions in 2020 saved lives and livelihoods. We closed our borders. We established the National Cabinet. We invested, as, as a federal government, $291 billion in direct assistance to individuals and businesses to cushion the impact. And we know that these measures have had a significant impact on all Australians and have ensured that we've been able to weather this storm together. And when we look globally, uh, not all countries can say that. The Liberal and Nationals government has stood side by side with all members of the Australian community throughout the pandemic and will continue to do so as the Delta variant wreaks havoc in so many of our states and communities. As the virus evolves, so does our government's response, because there is no guidebook for COVID. And that's why I'm proud to be part of a government that's delivering targeted, localised, individual uh, support payments to those who live or work in a Commonwealth declared hotspot. There are two tiers of payments. If you have lost more than 20 hours of work as a result of the lockdown, you are eligible for a $750 payment. If you've lost between eight and 20 hours uh, as a result of that declaration, you're eligible for $450. And if you're on income support payments and have been working, you are also eligible for a $200 payment if you've lost more than eight hours. I would recommend that those who are in those uh, areas apply online to keep services as Australia's phone Senator lines McKenzie. open for those. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. On the 28th of July, Prime Minister Morrison announced an expansion to the COVID disaster payment. Can the minister provide details on the increased financial assistance being provided through the scheme and how this will affect communities in lockdown? Senator McKenzie. Thank you. If people have lost hours due to the impact of lockdown, I do encourage them to apply, log on to Services Australia or MyGov uh, and actually apply for these income support payments. We've rolled them out in Victoria, we're rolling them out in South Australia. They're helping and assisting uh, people in New South Wales right now and will continue to do so as that lockdown uh, is extended. And they will be available to those Australians in those Commonwealth uh, declared hotspots in South East Queensland. Because we know that this is tough. Being locked down is tough. You have to shut your business. You can't go to work. You have to homeschool your kids. Uh, we actually, and it doesn't just impact your financial situation, it also impacts your mental health situation. So we have a raft of payments in addition to this. The pandemic leave payment assists you so that if you are caring for someone with COVID, or indeed you uh, catch COVID, that we will be standing with you to ensure that you have financial Order, support. Senator McKenzie. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the standard process for the COVID-19 disaster payment that will be undertaken for future lockdowns should these occur? Senator McKenzie. Well, as this pandemic has rolled through the world and indeed our own nation over the last 18 months, state and federal governments have had to adjust their responses accordingly. We've used science, we've used data, we've used evidence. We've used the advice of our medical officials, which is exactly what we should be doing. We should be taking the politics out of our COVID response. And that's why I look forward to those opposite. Uh, supporting Australians to get vaccinated as fast as possible, because that's how we can actually get out of being locked down, actually stopping those lockdowns by ensuring that Australians aren't just getting Pfizer, aren't Order. just getting Moderna, but are actually Order. lining up to get AstraZeneca. Senator and I look Wong. forward to Labor Party senators tweeting, putting in their newsletters, making sure at their local branch meeting they're encouraging Australians of all ages to adopt the medical advice, get vaccinated and access Order. AstraZeneca. Order. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Lambie's on her feet. Senator Lambie. 
Senator Wong, Senator Lambie's on her feet. Order. Order. <laughs> Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Attorney General, Minister Cash. Minister, the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide is underway. People are ready to make a submission. We are waiting further instructions. They want to be called to give evidence at a hearing, but before they can do that, a lot of them need funding for legal advice. It's been three months since the Prime Minister announced the Royal Commission. When will people know what the plan of attack is here? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her question. And I also thank Thanks, Senator Lambie, for working constructively with me uh, in the lead up to the announcement of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veterans Suicide. Uh, and Senator Lambie, you are correct. On the 8th of July 2021, uh, the Royal Commission, as you know, uh, into Defence and Veterans Suicide was established by letters patent following agreement from the Governor General and a period of consultation, which you and I consulted on, in relation to the terms of reference. What we've done as a government is we've provided $145.3 million over two years from 2021-22 for the Royal Commission, including to support families and advocacy organisations to participate in the inquiry. We are committed also, as you know, to establishing an independent national commissioner, and you and I have discussed this, for defence and veteran suicide prevention. In terms of the Royal Commission itself, uh, it will be required to deliver its interim report by the 11th of August 2022 and a final report by the 15th of June 2023. In terms of engagement with the Royal Commission, which is what you have referred to, it will be up to the Royal Commission itself to determine the most appropriate ways to engage with people about their experiences, whilst balancing that with the need to complete the inquiry in a timely manner. I think you and I actually discussed uh, that the letters patent recognised the need to establish accessible and appropriate trauma-informed arrangements for people engaging with the inquiry. The Royal Commission itself is now accepting submissions from all interested people and for organisations. Uh, it is, though, as you know, independent from government, and it itself will actually determine how all hearings uh, should be run. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. So, uh, the tender for the government's legal advice helpline only opened two weeks ago. The Royal Commission was called before Anzac Day. Uh, you know, why, didn't, why can't, can't the department or the government walk and chew gum at the same time. Now, you already decided you were having a Royal Commission back in April. Why couldn't you have asked for tenders back then, even before you got anything signed off? Why are we so far behind? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you and I will have to disagree in relation to why we are so far behind. Um, and again, I thank you for working constructively with me uh, in relation to the terms of reference of the Royal Commission, uh, just in terms of what support will be available uh, for people who want to engage with the Royal Commission. And as I said, it is for the Royal Commission itself to determine uh, how those people will be engaged. Uh, but certainly the government recognised the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and the fact that these people do need to be, as you and I have discussed, professionally supported. Counselling and support services will be available to assist people calling or engaging with the Royal Commission, including counselling support available before, during and after a person participates in a hearing or a private session. A legal financial assistance scheme, and again you and I have discussed this, will also be available to people called as witnesses to the Cash. Royal Commission. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, can you guarantee that the thousands of us who have taken years to fight the department have thousands of pages of documentation will have funding to use our own lawyers if we get called up to by the Royal Commissioner? Can you guarantee me that there will be no more psychological harm done to any of us or our children? Senator Cash. And again, thank you, Senator Lambie. And you raise a very good point in terms of uh, as I referred to in my previous question, uh, the fact that support does need to be made available uh, to people who are engaging with the Royal Commission, uh, in particular recognising the types of experiences that these people 
have had. And that's why when we set up the Royal Commission, one thing we were very, very clear about is recognising the importance for those engaging with the Royal Commission and to ensure that there are the mechanisms in place uh, so that they are professionally supported. And again, I've, as I've said to you, if there are any ways that you feel um, order, that these Senator Cash, Senator Lambie on a point of order. Senator yeah, thank Lambie. you, Mr. President. Um, I think you know, to save everybody some hurt here, we just want to know if we get called up in front of the Royal Commissioner. Senator Lambie, what's your, your point of order? My point of Sorry. order is I asked the question, will we have funding to use our own lawyers? That is what I would like answered, please. You, we need to know this now. Senator Lambie, I've yeah, allowed I'm sorry, you to Mr. President, I've, there is a lot of people hurting out there Senator, because of this, Senator and I'm going to put it, I'm going to stop it now. Senator Lambie. One question, Senator can Lambie, we use our own lawyers? Senator Lambie, please resume your seat. I allowed you to restate part of the question. I wasn't sure what you were doing. I allowed you to restate part of your question. Um, you reminded the minister of the question. She has 16 seconds remaining to answer. Uh, as I said, Senator Lambie, legal, uh, a legal financial assistance scheme will be available to people who are called as witnesses. An independent legal advisory service, counselling and support services will also be made available to people engaging with the Royal Commission, and private sessions will also Order. be available Senator for Cash, individuals time for the answer has who wish to share. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister, can the minister confirm the Morrison government's 70 per cent Phase B target only includes Australians aged over 16, and as a proportion of the population is only 56 per cent? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, as I indicated to the, to the Chamber earlier, the advice on the targets is based on the modelling of the Doherty Institute. It's not, some, it, it's not a number that's been chosen by the Prime Minister or, for that matter, by any of the State Premiers and National Cabinet. It's based on research by the Doherty Institute on the thresholds required to start reopening the Australian economy and community during the pandemic, Mr. President. So it's, the, the thresholds that are being put forward are based on the research, Mr. President. As I've indicated to Senator Seward earlier, that research is going to be released publicly. Senator so Wong, all Australians a have point access of order. To Senator Colbeck, Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Point of order direct relevance, a very simple question, uh, which is clear from the Doherty research released, and I assume this minister is aware of it, that the 70 per cent relates to the population over 16, and if they are included, in fact, the threshold is 56 per cent. We're asking the minister to confirm it. Um, Senator Colbeck, on, on this occasion, the question was specific and factual in nature. Um, to be directly relevant, you must address, address the facts in question. Um, so I'm going to remind you of the question. It was a specific question seeing, seeking a fact. You've had 50 seconds, uh, and I'll remind you of the question that was asked. Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the thresholds uh, are based on the Doherty Institute research that has been publicly released. Uh, and, and, and the research is based on the vaccination profile of the population uh, that was assessed by the Doherty Institute, Mr. President. So I am happy to confirm the numbers that are in the Doherty Institute data. Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator, Senator Wong. I repeat my previous point of order. Um, and I would have supported that point. The minister at the last sentence, he said he was confirming numbers contained in the modelling uh, that was referred to in the question. So I'm going to ask the minister to restrain his comments to the facts sort um, but at that point, in my view, he was being directly relevant with that phrase being used. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, um, the reason we're releasing the Doherty Institute data is so that all Australians understand completely the parameters for the opening of the community. That's why I'm very comfortable in confirming that information and that data as presented by the Doherty Institute. It's important that everybody understand, that all Australians understand, that the decisions that we're being made 
that, that the government is making in conjunction with the states to open the economy and to open the community is based on research uh, as has been um, accessed by the government. And so I'm very comfortable in confirming Order, the figures. Colbeck, in the Senator Gaudians, Chisholm, a supplementary uh, question. Thanks, Mr. President. 10 of yesterday's 13 new COVID-19 cases in South East Queensland were children under the age of nine. Children under the age of 16 are still not eligible, able to access vaccinations. When will parents be informed about their children's eligibility for the vaccine? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, in fact, uh, the Minister for Health in the last day or so has actually confirmed access to vaccine for children between the age of 12 and 16 um, based on certain health conditions. So that process is being commenced uh, and is being supported by the advice of a target, Mr. President. Uh, we have one vaccine that currently uh, has approval for use for children between 12 and 16, and that is the Pfizer vaccine, Mr. President. And the Minister for Health yesterday announced a number of parameters where children with certain uh, health indicators can, in fact, start to access uh, a vaccine, Mr. President. There are no vaccines at this point in time in Australia that have been for, approved for use for children under the age of 12, Mr. President. So we will continue to follow the health advice in the support of Australians. Senator Colbeck, vaccines. time for the answer has expired. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government is confident vaccinating just 56 per cent of the population will protect Australians and allow for reduced restrictions? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, that is the advice from the Doherty Institute. That's why we're following the advice from the Doherty Institute. Uh, and that's, that's why we commissioned the work in the first place so that we would, could understand and make the appropriate decisions on the thresholds that were required for governments through National Cabinet uh, and at a state level to make their decisions in relation to reopening the economy uh, and the community. We all want to see the back of this pandemic as soon as possible, Mr President. That's why we continue to work every day to ensure uh, availability and access to vaccines and to grow that availability and access, Mr. President. So the work that's being, the decisions that are being taken are based on the research that's been commissioned by the government at the request of National Cabinet uh, to support the reopening of the Australian economy. Uh, and we will continue to follow that advice. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small Business and Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. In light of the unprecedented economic situation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and these ensuing waves, can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are securing Australia's recovery by continuing to support small and family businesses right across Australia to get through the current COVID-19 lockdowns. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Uh, Mr President, as you know, small and family businesses, there is no doubt they are the backbone of the Australian economy. And since the outset of COVID-19, the Morrison government has backed small and family business with unprecedented levels of support. And of course, we will continue to do so. We also know, and you just look at the numbers in the Senate here today, that there is still a lot more work to do. We've now seen recent COVID outbreaks in Victoria, in New South Wales and in Queensland. And what that says to us is we're not out of the woods yet. In terms of New South Wales, the business support package in New South Wales, which we partnered with the New South Wales government to deliver, provides a template now for further support measures that will help small and family businesses get through the pandemic. In New South Wales, again in partnership with the New South Wales government, we are delivering between 1,500 
and $100,000 per week for qualifying businesses that have seen a significant downturn in their revenues. For smaller businesses, and in particular small and micro businesses, those ones that only have a small number of employees, they'll receive a minimum payment of $1,500 per week. And Mr President, as you know, in your home state of Victoria, we also partnered with the Victorian government in business support during their recent lockdown. And we, of course, stand ready now to work with the Queensland government, as we did with the Victorian and the New South Wales governments, to provide the economic support for small businesses to get them through the lockdowns. We've done this before, and we know that businesses will come through this and will get back to doing what they do best, which is, of course, employ Australians. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline to the Senate how the government is supporting our sole traders across Australia throughout these lockdowns? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, what we saw last year with the onset of COVID-19 was the Morrison government providing crucial economic support to sole traders to keep their businesses going. We utilised measures like JobKeeper and, of course, when I was the Employment Minister, allowing owners to meet their mutual obligations by working in their business. That was so important, so they didn't need to close their business down. This helped around 690,000 sole traders around Australia, and it meant that they were able to continue in their business. They could hibernate their business if necessary, and then as restrictions eased, they could get back into business. And of course, this time round, it is no different. For sole traders who are currently affected in Queensland, from Saturday, you now have the ability to apply for the COVID disaster payment. Services Australia will open applications on Saturday the 7th of August and claims will start being processed from Sunday the 8th of August. You just need to go through MyGov. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister also advise what individual Australians can do to support our small and family businesses and sole traders and contribute to our economic recovery. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, across Australia, it doesn't matter where we are, supporting our small and family businesses, and in particular those who are affected by the lockdowns, is just so important. So many businesses are still able to keep their presence going via the internet. And so I'd say to anybody across Australia, if you do know a small business uh, that is affected by the lockdown, but they are still able to keep going, uh, it is just so important that we are out there and we're supporting them. Uh, Australians are obviously doing everything they can to help get through this difficult pandemic. However, what we want in particular for our small and family businesses is for them to be operate freely under circumstances as close as normal to possible. And of course, the best way individual Australians can support our small and family businesses and of course thereby contribute to our economic recovery is to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. Getting vaccinated is our path back to normality and the key to our recovery. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the new Minister for uh, Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for in her new role as the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education? The Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I do thank the senator uh, for his interest in how our government is supporting those communities right throughout rural and regional Australia, recover from natural disasters, respond to um, what is Senator, often— Senator Farrell, on a point of order. Uh, point of order, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, it was a very simple, straightforward question. How many discretionary grant programs is the minister responsible for? Um, you reminded the minister of the question. I will take the opportunity that while I won't judge direct relevance in 15 seconds when the minister is introducing her answer, um, I will remind the minister it was a very factual question uh, and doesn't provide much room for commentary in order to be directly relevant. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. And, uh, Senator Farrell, I was through you, Mr. President, was absolutely going to 
uh, outline all the grant programs that our government is very proud to be able to deliver to the communities who have been affected by flood, by bushfire and uh, Senator indeed— Farrell on a, Senator McKenzie, I have Senator Farrell on a point of order. Look, I appreciate— I appreciate, I appreciate that this is the first time the Minister has had to answer questions since her uh, coming yes, back Senator to Farrell, the position, the but uh, I don't want to know all of the programs that the government has got in the grant uh, area. I want to know how many okay, so this Minister Farrell, is responsible I, 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 for. I do allow flexibility in making a point when direct relevance, but I do ask that Senators draw it to that. Senator McKenzie, this was a factual question asking about programs, um, not rationale or commentary around the programs. Um, the minister is entitled to list programs and be directly relevant or provide the uh, or answer in a form that Senator Farrell would seek, but it's not a place for commentary around programs. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And so I will go through the disaster recovery funding arrangements, the Disaster Resilience Australia package, where the min minister is responsible uh, for the measure, but the um, decisions are delegated to the NRRA. That's $2.1 million uh, for this fin financial year. The Disaster Risk Reduction Package, which is a package to reduce the risk and impact of disasters on Australians in line with our Disaster ri Risk Reduction Framework, its co-funding obviously with the Australian and state and territory governments. Approval for these reports by the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience Agency will trigger in 2021-22 payments to the states and territories in June 2022. Then we've got the Emergency Response Fund. This funding is actually to fund emergency response, natural disaster recovery and preparedness initiatives. Uh, that is also uh, the purvey of the NRRA. Then we have the Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program, a $280 million grant program over the next three years, uh, which is actually to assist those communities who have been impacted by bushfires. Uh, the Minister for Emergency Management and Recovery, that would be me, uh, is the decision maker. The local economic uh, Order, recovery Senator McKenzie, program. Senator McKenzie, time for the answer has um, expired. Oh. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, uh, President. Uh, I have a further supplementary uh, question. <laughs> Uh, is the minister responsible for any other grant programs in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communication and uh, Regional Education? Bearing in mind my first question related to discre discretionary grant programs. <laughs> Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Local Economic Recovery Program, uh, where the Coordinator General, uh, whilst it is in my purvey, he and state governments are the final decision makers on that one. The restocking, replanting and on-farm infrastructure grants. Uh, the minister only involved in funding decision if there's a change in the National Partnership Agreement. The Resilient Kids, what a great program. Senator Macdonald and I were able to announce $2 million to school children who have been in flood-affected uh, communities for mental health support. Um, those decisions are part of a national, party, uh, the par national partnership agreement, economic diversification over the next three years. Uh, that's $9 million. Uh, again, is covered by the National Partnership Agreement, as is the telecommunications and energy improvement schemes. Uh, management of disaster risk, again, is under the National uh, Partnership uh, Agreement um, reallocation issues. The Recovery and Resilience Order, Grants, Senator which is McKenzie. $20 million Senator over Farrell, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And if there are some others that the minister didn't get to answer, then I'd be happy if she um, T tabled the documents. But I have a further question. How much funding uh, or budget allocation has been provided to the Minister, discretionary or otherwise, in her new roles as Minister for Emergency Management, uh, National Recovery and Resilience, and Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Reg Regional Education? Senator McKenzie. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Uh, I will have to get back to you with the totality of the budget allocations. Obviously, my last 
uh, three weeks, as you can see from the brief time we've had to spend together outlying the programs that I'm responsible for and who makes decisions. I've got a lot more to go through, which I'm happy to uh, give you a private briefing if, if that would assist you. But I think the heart of your question, Senator, might actually be going to the role of ministerial discretion in a Westminster democracy. Now, I'm actually, as I've said on the public record, Ministerial discretion is absolutely key to how our government functions. Ministers should take the advice uh, and recommendations of departments and agencies and then exercise ministerial discretion appropriately. Um, and my ministerial discretion in other programs I've administered resulted in a fairer Order. outcome Senator for Mackenzie, Australian taxpayers. Time has expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, also, Mr. President, um, uh, for the benefit of the Senate, uh, on behalf of Senator Colbeck, I can provide some further information in response to the questions asked by Senator Seward uh, about the publication of the uh, modelling conducted by the Doherty Institute. Uh, I can advise uh, the Senate and uh, through the Senate, Senator Seward. Um, that that modelling is all published and available uh, on the PMNC website. Uh, three particular documents available there. Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, dated 30 July 2021. Addendum to Doherty Modelling Report for National Cabinet, dated 30 July 2021. Uh, and findings and implications of the Doherty Institute COVID-19 modelling presentation. I've got, I'm going to, I'll come to you next. I understand I had Senator Reynolds was going to seek the call about a matter in question time. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President. During question time, I took a question on notice from uh, Senator Griff, and I'd like leave to table the response. I don't think you need leave as oh, a minister, will... Senator Reynolds. I'll take it as table. I table, thank there you. Being no other matters, I'll call Senator McKim seeking the call. Uh, yes, thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to tax policy in Australia as circulated in the chamber. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator thank, McKim. Thank you, President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to tax policy in Australia may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Mr President, the Australian Greens are disappointed and saddened in the extreme by the recent policy capitulation of the Australian Labor Party, namely that should they win government at the next election, they would not repeal the stage three income tax cuts, they would not make any changes to the current negative gearing arrangements and they would not repeal the capital gains tax concession. This absolute capitulation means that whether it is the Australian Labor Party uh, McKim, or the Liberal... Senator McKim, I remind you and any other senators who may speak in this debate that uh, you, you, the purpose of you moving the motion and speaking to it is to um, inform the Senate of why the matter is urgent, not going to the subject of your motion. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Deputy President. And this matter is urgent because this is a very recent utter policy capitulation by the Australian Labor Party that will have a massive negative effect on everyone except the absolutely wealthy and super wealthy in this country. And it means that whether it is uh, the LNP or the ALP that sits on the government benches after the next election, we will see spiralling economic inequality in this country. The rich will get even more rich, and for everyone else, the task of making a good life will be made even harder. This cave-in sells out working people by putting nurses and teachers on the same income tax rate as Senator managers McKim. and consultants who own up to 200,000. Resume your seat, please. I've already drawn to your attention the purpose of this debate is for you to explain to the Senate why the motion is urgent. That's what you need to go to, not the substantive matter of your motion. Senator Wish Wilson. Board of Order, Deputy President. Senator McKim did follow your instructions. Um, and so Senator, why Senator it was Wish urgent. Wilson, please resume your seat. It's not a debating point. I am simply explaining the standing orders that require senators to go to the matter 
of why it's urgent. Thank you, Senator McKee. It is an urgent matter because the Australian Labor Party's policy capitulation sells out working people by putting nurses and teachers on the same income tax rates as managers and consultants on up to $200,000 a year. It sells out anyone who is struggling with the cost of housing by continuing to allow property investors to rack up their third, fourth, fifth, tenth or twentieth investment property with the help of a massive public subsidy. This is urgent because these decisions mean cuts into Senator the future McKean. on essential Senator services McKean. like health and education. Please resume your seat. Please res the purpose of the standing order that you're using is for you to explain to the Senate not to go to the heart of the motion of why it is the Senate must entertain your urgency motion today. And I would ask you to reflect on that for a moment and to go to that substantive matter, not the matter of the motion. Thank you, Senator McKim. The sentence I was uttering when you interrupted me, President, literally started with the words, this is urgent because. That is exactly what I'm doing. It's urgent because it will mean house prices continue to spiral out of control, making more older women homeless uh, and McKim, forcing young Senator people— Senator McKim, please oh, resume please. your seat. Thank you, um, Minister. Deputy President, point of order, because I am concerned that, uh, that Senator McKim is either acting in defiance of your rulings or is not understanding your rulings. The motion before the chamber is one to suspend standing orders. Uh, the debate that you have been seeking to inform Senator McKim that he should be undertaking is one about why it is that the motion itself needs to be considered now and warrants the suspension of standing orders. Just framing your statements with the words, this is urgent because, and then going on to debate the policy substance of the motion he seeks to have debated uh, is not mounting a case in relation to the suspension of standing orders. Uh, and I would uh, thank you, Senator, Deputy President, for your ruling, uh, but certainly urge all senators to understand the nuance of what the question before the chair is and relevance to that particular question. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. On the point of order, Chair, if you were to accept uh, the proposition uh, put to you by Senator Birmingham, you would effectively be saying that in order to stay within the bounds of standing orders, no reference at all can be made to the substantive issue. That is patently a ridiculous proposition that Senator Birmingham is putting and would constitute an unnecessary restraint on this debate, and I urge you to reject his point of order. Uh, Senator McKim, I have ruled. Um, it is a rule and it, it's not a debating point. Um, of course, you can reference your motion, but what I've heard you uh, speak to since you got to your feet is only the motion and you have not referenced why it is that this motion is so urgent that we have to stand aside uh, the business of the Senate for today and deal with this motion. That's the issue at heart. It's not for you to immediately go to the motion, but to explain to the Senate what's urgent about it. And I would ask you uh, to respect my ruling and to explain to the Senate, without uh, a great reference to the actual motion, of why it's urgent that this matter be dealt with now. We need to suspend the standing orders because it is urgent that we bring this motion on for debate because of the impact of the Australian Labor Party's policies, which will mean that young people, whether they be renters or prospective homeowners, will need to spend more and more of their income in putting a roof over their head. So why has Labor caved to give tax cuts and tax breaks to the millionaires uh, and McKean, the billionaires. Resume your seat, uh, Senator Scar. Point of order, Deputy President. I mean, you've been quite clear with respect to the application of the standing order. And Senator McKim, I've been listening very closely. I have not heard him say one point in favour of the matter as to why this must be discussed now as a matter of urgency. It is all about general policy points. Thank you, Senator Scar. Um, Senator McKim, you, you started off well. 
uh, about explaining to the Senate why the matter was urgent, and then you did go back to the substantive motion. I'd ask you to continue in the vein of explaining to the Senate why this motion, this, this, the motion you've moved that the Senate deal with the matter now, is the urgency. It's urgent, and we need to suspend standing orders because the planet is cooking and neoliberalism is taking over in this country because every time the Labor Party caves in, the Liberals take the win, move the ground and the contest further to the right. Climate change is critical. It is an urgent issue and it should be debated as a matter of urgency by the Senate. This kind of approach by the Labor Party is how we've ended up in the neoliberal mess that we're in on tax, on housing, uh, on Senator public McKim, subsidies from Senator fossil McKim. fuels. They're very uncomfortable McKim, about this in the Australian Labor your Party. Seat. Thank you. Senator Wong. Um, uh, a point of order of relevance. Um, Senator McKim is now not only um, refusing to debate the reason for suspension, he's actually even gone beyond the substantive motion. So we've gone even further and he's laughing. And, you know, I understand, we all understand why you're doing this, a bit of a stunt. Uh, I have to say, I want to express some of our concerns about the treatment by those two male senators of the Deputy President in this discussion. I want to register that. Well, I want to register that. I want to register that. Uh, but, well, here we go again. Here we go again. Here we go again. I am registering. Order. Order. You always interrupt us, don't you? I think Senator Hanson Young could teach you something. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator McKim, I was allowing you some leniency to get back to uh, the urgency of explaining to the Senate the urgency of the, stand the suspension that you've sought. Please continue. The urgency, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, sorry, Madam Deputy President, with the absolute greatest of respect to you and your position, uh, and Senator Wong and hers and anyone else in this chamber, is simply that this debate, relate, the debate that we are seeking to bring on, relates to critical and urgent issues in the Australian public conversation and the point that whenever Labor adopts a small target strategy, the Liberals take the win and move the goalposts further to the right. That is the urgency of this matter. That is why it should be debated by the Senate today, because the Australian people want the Australian Labor Party to stand for something and to stand up for them on these urgent issues that urgently need debating in the chamber today, which is why we should suspend the standing orders to bring on this debate. The only hope for people who want to address spiralling economic inequality in this place is to vote Green, because that is the only language that the Australian Labor Party understands. We will fight economic inequality in this country, in the Australian Greens, and we invite the Australian Labor Party to join us and not Thank you, capitulate. Senator McKim. Your time has expired. Minister. Mr President, I move the question be put. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Now be put. So okay. Your pardon. Uh, my apologies. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Birmingham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Stop the bells. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator McKim as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and three noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the question now is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. Order. So the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Watt as teller for the noes. Uh, we're still waiting for the teller for the eyes.
order, there being three ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just give senators a few moments to resume their seats and uh, for those not participating in taking note to leave the chamber if they so wish. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the question asked by Senator Wong. Uh, and in doing so, I might just make the point that it's very interesting that uh, after a six-week recess, the very first thing the Greens decide to do when they come into the chamber is to attack the Labor Party. Um, they don't worry about attacking this government or the LNP or the, things, the government that is actually doing the terrible things to Australia. No, for the Greens, it's always about political stunts targeted at the Labor Party because we know that it's the Labor Party who they consider to be the real enemy. But unlike the Greens, Labor is actually here to defend Australians, no matter where they live, uh, from the incompetence, the bungling and the shambles uh, that we have seen from this Prime Minister and this government in the management of COVID-19. The Prime Minister, when COVID started, and particularly this year, had two jobs, to get the vaccine rollout working and to build purpose-built quarantine. Now, we know that he has grossly failed in those two jobs. When it comes to vaccine rollout, we are the last in the developed world. When it comes to quarantine, it will be months, if not years, before we have purpose-built quarantine stations. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, I can't recollect the word quarantine even being used during the whole of question time that we've just been through. So I query whether or not uh, uh, Mr. Watts, Senator Watts in order in terms of the comments he's making. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. It is a wide-ranging debate, and I think uh, it is order. Um, it is uh, Senator what has referred to the vaccine rollout, and that's been the substantive part of his argument. Um, but I will certainly listen closely, and if he doesn't stick uh, in the rest of his time to the debate, I will call his attention to that matter. Thank you, Senator Watt. Thank you, thank you Madam Deputy President. I can assure Senator Scar that there is plenty to talk about when it comes to this government's vaccine rollout failures, but it is worth mentioning in passing uh, that there will be months, if not years, before they build purpose-built quarantine stations. And as a result, we have seen 27 leaks of hotel quarantine from hotel quarantine. So that is the result of this Prime Minister's failures to do his job. And now, because the Prime Minister failed to do his two jobs, vaccine rollout and quarantine, we now see 10 million Australians in lockdown across Sydney and across South East Queensland. And of course, there are many more Australians who are suffering outside of lockdown areas as well. These are the Australians who are paying the price for this Prime Minister and this government's failures to do their job and get the vaccine rollout working and to build purpose-built quarantine. So why are we here? Why are we now at a point where 10 million Australians are in lockdown, with millions more outside lockdown areas also being impacted by this, this government's failures? If you want one sentence to explain why we are in this situation, it is a sentence that we heard over and over again from this Prime Minister. At that, that sentence is, it's not a race. It's not a race. It's not a competition. How many times did we hear that from this Prime Minister and other ministers in this government as Labor was appealing for the government to do more vaccine deal deals, to get more vaccines out to Australians, to build purpose-built quarantine and to do all of the other things necessary to protect the Australian public from the Delta variant that we have now seen raging across so much of Australia. But no, every time Labor tried to suggest things that the government could be doing, just as we're doing today when it comes to incentives, what were we told by the Prime Minister and his his minions, it's not a race, it's not a competition. Well, how wrong they were. Because I can tell you, it was a race, it was always a race. It was a race for the 10 million Australians who are now in lockdown across Sydney and across South East Queensland. It was a race 
for the businesses who are losing money as a result of this, these lockdowns. It was a race for the workers who are losing their jobs because of the lockdowns, because this government didn't get vaccines out and didn't do its other jobs. It was a race for the families like mine and millions of others in South East Queensland and Sydney who are now homeschooling, who are now unable to do the various things that they would normally do with their families. It was a race for many other people, millions of other Australians outside the lockdown areas who are also suffering because this Prime Minister and this government didn't do their job and get vaccine deals done and get vaccines into people's arms. Only last week, I, before the lockdown started in South East Queensland, I was back up in Cairns and Port Douglas meeting with tourism operators. and They were telling me that after, May, after hitting uh, very high hotel occupancy rates in May uh, of around 85 per cent, as soon as the lockdown started in Melbourne and Sydney, their occupancy rates crashed to 30 per cent. Why? Because we didn't have vaccines in, in arms and we therefore had to have lockdowns the minute uh, that the variant started taking control. It was the same in the Gold Coast and other tourism areas as well. Uh, hundreds and thousands of bookings cancelled uh, and putting pe businesses and jobs on the line because this government couldn't do its job. So it was a race. It was a race for the people in lockdown. It was a race for the businesses and workers outside of lockdown areas who are suffering. It was a race for the aged care workers, the disability workers who can't get vaccinated. And it was pretty interesting that even Minister Colbeck wouldn't uh, associate himself with the Prime Minister's remarks. Imagine Richard Thank Colbeck you, being Senator too Watt, embarrassed to stand with you. Expired. Senator Scar. Madam Deputy President, Senator Watt asked the question, why are so many people in this country in lockdown? And the reason is because of the Delta variant, the Delta variant of the COVID-19 vaccine, of the COVID-19. That's the reason they're in lockdown, because of the Delta 19 variant of the COVID-19 virus. Not for any other reason, because of that reason. And we're seeing all over the world the devastating impact of the Delta variant. It is easy, easy, Madam Deputy President, to stand on the sidelines and throw bricks at those on the field who are making difficult decisions, taking advice from the people they should be taking advice from, from the independent experts, the scientific experts and others, making calls on the run. It's easy to stand on the sideline and throw bricks at people who are making difficult decisions in difficult timelines. The fact of the matter is, that when you look at the results of the vaccine rollout, the most recent results, they are quite staggering, quite incredible actually. When you consider the fact, Madam Deputy President, that one million doses were first issued in 45 days, and we've now reached the position, we've now reached the position where more than a million doses, more than a million doses are being given of the vaccine, whether it be AstraZeneca, whether or not it's Pfizer, more than a million doses are being given every six days, every six days. So it took 45 days for a million doses, and now it's taking six days for a million doses. The rollout has progressively increased. A million doses, 45 days, two million doses, 20 days, three million doses, 17 days. You can see the increase. You can see the increase in the doses which are being provided. And we're now at a situation, thankfully, thankfully, we are now in a situation where almost 80 per cent, probably now over 80 per cent, of over 70s are protected with the first dose of a vaccine. That most vulnerable cohort, that most vulnerable cohort in our community, over 80 per cent are protected with one, at least one dose of the vaccine. 41.98 per cent have received a second dose. More than 65 per cent of my cohort of over 50s are protected with the first dose and 26.67 per cent have received a second dose. So we're actually seeing, a, we've seen a phenomenal increase in the rollout of this vaccine in a context, in a context where this is a global pandemic, a one in 100 years global pandemic with different variations, variants of the virus developing over time, posing new challenges, and the Delta variant has pr proposed, has presented a number of unique challenges in terms of how quickly it spreads. And can I say to those opposite, not only shouldn't you be throwing bricks at our Prime Minister, but you shouldn't be throwing bricks at the Premier of New South Wales either. Again, again, that Premier is on the field, making decisions in real time, taking advice from everyone who she considers is appropriate to give her advice. And sometimes the result's not perfect. 
Sometimes the result's not perfect, and it wouldn't be perfect no matter who was in the position of Premier of New South Wales or Prime Minister of Australia. It wouldn't be perfect no matter who was in that position. And that's a factor, that's a factor of the actual situation which we're facing at the moment. It's a dynamic situation, a one in 100 year situation, a global pandemic. And the best, the most reasonable, the most reasonable way of assessing the success or otherwise of the federal government is to compare the situation in Australia to that overseas. And who can legitimately say, who can reasonably say in this place that Australia hasn't done better than any other country in the world in terms of those two key measurements, protecting lives and protecting livelihoods? We've done better than any other country on the face of the earth. And if those opposite can think of somewhere else that's done better in terms of protecting lives and protecting livelihoods, then tell us who it is, because I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is. Protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. This country has done an exceeding job, and I pay tribute to all of our decision makers. And I don't care which party they come from. The people who are on the field making decisions in real time in, challenging, in a challenging situation, a one in 100 years global pandemic, different variations of the virus developing all the time and making the best decisions they can in good faith in, in confronted in those circumstances. And I think, uh, I think as Australians get more confidence with the vaccine, I was so pleased today the Chief Health Officer of Queensland has, issued, uh, has reflected on her opinion with respect to AstraZeneca and hopefully we'll have more Thank and you, more Senator vaccines Scar, issued. Your time has expired. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. Well, let's compare ourselves to overseas. What Senator Scar didn't do was compare ourselves to overseas when it comes to vaccine rollout. Uh, we're actually 36 out of 38 on the OECD. So we're actually coming almost last when it comes to our vaccine rollout. And there's two things we learnt in question time today. And that is that they still won't set a deadline on vaccine rollout. They still won't set a deadline on vaccine rollout. And we know why. Because every time they have set one, they've missed it. So they've actually given up on it. And they won't provide those incentives. And we've seen a pitiful uh, display from uh, the senior levels of this government today um, when Labor put forward a really practical solution and they were happy to take pot shots at it without putting forward any sort of practical solutions themselves. But they won't set a deadline and we saw that in question time today with the answers given. But we know why they won't set a deadline because they originally said four million Australians would be vaccinated by the end of March and they failed to meet that. Uh, Mr Morrison previously said all Australians would be fully vaccinated by October. Obviously we're going to miss that. He said they would vaccinate the first priority group by Easter, and they've missed that deadline. And they would vaccinate 6 million Australians by the 10th of May. So when it comes to vaccines, they've actually given up. They actually aren't setting any deadlines because they know they can't meet them, and they're not creating the incentives for Australians to go out and get vaccinated. And even when uh, the Labor leader put forward a substantial suggestion today, the government have done nothing but take pot shots at that, which is so disappointing. They show uh, no um, ability to adapt or be nimble uh, and actually deliver for the Australian people. And they still won't accept the second thing that we learnt from Question Time is they still won't accept responsibility. Uh, and anyone who would have seen Four Corners last night laid out uh, how responsible the government are for the failure to deliver. And as uh, Kevin Rudd said, they wouldn't pick up the Graham Alexander Bell and talk to the head of Pfizer to try and get more vaccines delivered to this country. So it is uh, having a devastating impact on uh, South East Queensland at the moment. We've seen what's happening in New South Wales. 10 million Australians locked down. Um, the damage this does economically as well, I think the RBA estimated it was about $300 million a day that has been taken away from these economies because of what is going on in these communities. Uh, and it is absolutely the failure of the vaccine rollout that is going to deliver. And we saw that with the release of the Doherty report today. It says uh, what we can achieve um, if we actually had the vaccine rollout as compared to what is happening in other countries. 
But it also goes to, and as Senator Watts said, it also goes to the quarantine, faci quarantine facilities, because they did have two responsibilities. Uh, one was around vaccines. The second one was around quarantine facilities. And they haven't delivered on those as well. And about a month ago, the federal Labor leader, Anthony Albanese, and myself went to Toowoomba, and we met with the proponents of the WellCamp proposal around quarantine facilities. They said they could be operating within 12 weeks set up a purpose-built quarantine facility within 12 weeks. Yet the government keep moving the goalposts, changing the rules to rule out doing some sort of uh, deal with uh, proponents in Toowoomba. And what they've instead said is that they would look at doing something at Damascus, uh, near, Pink near the Brisbane airport. But that isn't going to be operating till next year. Uh, we've seen all these leaks—I think we're up to 28 now—leaks out of hotel quarantine quarantine facilities, yet we haven't had one leak out of Howard Springs in the Northern Territory. And the Toowoomba proposal would be similar to that Howard Springs proposal. So it shows you that these facilities that are purpose-built can work and deliver. And who knows, if we actually had that facility, we might be having the lockdown that we've had in South East Queensland this week. So this question time, again, it's the first question time we've had for about six weeks, but it's still the same old excuses from the government. Uh, they won't set a deadline on getting Australians vaccinated. They still won't set, accept responsibility for the failure of the, quarant of the vaccine rollout. And when you look at the devastation that this is causing across Australia, uh, it is the Australian families, Australian workers, uh, indeed those kids that are now doing homeschooling that are paying the price for the incompetence of this government. Um, so I'd say to the government they need to get their act together, they need to start setting deadlines that they will stick to, and they need to ensure that the Australian people have confidence that the vaccine rollout uh, is going to be available, that people will be able to get their shots, um, that they will then be able to avoid lockdowns so that the economy can return to normal as much as possible. Um, again, it was a failure from this government to answer any of those questions today. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I rise to uh, respond to some of these extraordinary comments made by those on the other side, but I do reflect on how incredibly fortunate we are that we are going through a global pandemic and not a war, because Australians expect their leadership, their politicians, their representatives to stand together to find solutions to difficult times. And yet, once again, we have listened to uh, the opposition describe a complete lack of understanding to the reality of the world, an inability to stand shoulder to shoulder in difficult times and instead take every opportunity to throw stones because there has been no manual, no manual to the COVID pandemic. And instead, we find uh, the opposition trying to find ways of demonstrating how clever they would be now that they have the benefit of hindsight. Just brilliant. Uh, one of the senators just spoke about the 27 leaks from hotel quarantine, but no leaks from the federally operated Howard Springs. They also mentioned that there has not been a, a uh, fast enough rollout of the vaccine. So I would like to speak about what's been happening in my state, in the great state of Queensland. Because the greatest impediment to vaccinating Queenslanders has been our own Labor state government. In fact, Queensland Health did not order any AstraZeneca vaccines in July and only 1,000 doses in May. How extraordinary is that? Because despite the Chief Health Officer making uh, extraordinary pronouncements about AstraZeneca in the face of uh, worldwide recommendations to take advice from your medical practitioner. We have had uh, no, case, no AstraZeneca ordered in July. So Queenslanders are not being given the opportunity to consult with their doctor on what decision is best for them. Uh, in fact, I think the vaccine hesitancy in Queensland can be, can be sheeted back to some of this messaging. Queensland has the second lowest rate of fully vaccinated people at just over 18 per cent and the lowest rate of people who've had one dose at just under 37 per cent. Anecdotally, 
in my home city of Townsville, some young people say they have tried six times to be vaccinated and been turned away due to a lack of supply of Pfizer, even when they were happy and had, been consulted, and had consulted and were able to have AstraZeneca. Queensland Health Stats, as of yesterday, Monday, 591 people received a dose at the new Townsville vaccination station, but not one person received the vaccination from hospitals and health centres across the entire Townsville region. Not one person. The air population, 8,700 8, people, but just 796 shots provided in total, none yesterday. And Ingham, 4,300 people, just 677 shots provided, zero yesterday. Charters Towers, population of 8,100, just 627 total do doses administered, but none yesterday. The opposition is also going to talk about consulting with tourism operators in Cairns and Townsville, the very areas that were on their knees because the state government refused to reduce or increase the number of people allowed into the space from four per, one person for, per four square metres to one person per two square metres as it was on the mainland if you were going out on cruise boats and other charter vessels. Uh, these meant that these businesses were unviable far longer than they were in other states. Uh, they also talked about homeschooling and how difficult that is for parents, and it is. And the reason why we know that is because we have geographically isolated children right across this nation, which Labor never ever seems to reflect on or remember. But what has Labor come up with is a cash for jabs program. Now this is our latest version of pink bats, of school halls, and another example of Labor taking Australian taxpayers' money, but not, but not, improving the safety or the position for Australian people. Senator, oh, the question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate take note of responses to the question asked by Senator Seward. You can speak to that, Senator McKim. I think Senator Seward is seeking the call. Oh, sorry. Senator Seward is on the call. Sorry. Senator Seward. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm taking note. Sorry, I, I, I didn't. So I'll, I'll just pause. It's not your fault, Senator Seward. Um, yeah, I didn't have a list, so I didn't see anyone seeking the call. With the leave of the Senate, can I reverse the motion I put the, uh, of Senator Watt and call Senator Sheldon to speak to that motion, and then I'll go to Senator McKim and Senator Seward. Yeah. Senator Sheldon. I, I, we skipped one. Thank you, um, thank you, Mr. President. Let's go. I move that the Senate take note of answers provided by the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. I just want to, before I make a few comments, more comments about um, what has happened during this debate today, it just seems absolutely outrageous that we've got people not being vaccinated. We've got people in Sydney and Melbourne, the country's highest vaccination rates are the wealthiest pockets while poorer parts of Sydney's west and south, hit hardest by the latest outbreak, have been among the lowest coverage in New South Wales. Of course, let's just go a little bit further too, because while well, parts of outbreak Australia are also lagging behind with fewer than 10% of the population in some regional areas being fully vaccinated, more than five months into the rollout. Has there ever been a more damaging display of negligence in Australian history than the Prime Minister's vaccine stroll out? More than 10 million Australians are in lockdown across Sydney and South East Queensland. Lockdowns are costing the Australian economy nearly $300 million each day. While countries around the world are opening up, Australia is shutting down. This is because of the Prime Minister's insistence that vaccine rollout is not a race. Well, Prime Minister Morrison had two jobs this year, a speedy and effective rollout of the vaccine and quarantine, and he has monumentally failed both. Having failed, the Morrison government must now ensure it does not also fail to support Australian workers, with, uh, people without work, particularly those in sectors which have been hardest hit, such as aviation. Unfortunately, 
This is precisely what is happening. Aviation workers have been through 18 months of hell, and today they have received the latest kick in the guts. Australia's highest paid CEO, Alan Joyce, has announced he'll be standing down 2,500 Qantas and Jetstar workers without pay. The Morrison government has had more than 18 months to come up with a plan for the survival and recovery of Australian aviation, keeping the skill sets there that are so vital. The Qantas announcement came also just hours after the government had announced a program to provide COVID support payments to some aviation workers. The payments will only go to 50% of stood down pilots and crew. There are no payments for any other aviation workers. And our Prime Minister may not be aware, but there are thousands of other aviation workers who keep our planes in the air, including many of them that live in your electorate, raising their families and supporting their community. How about you start listening to those people from your own electorate, Prime Minister? Now, thousands of ground crew have been carved out of uh, Mr Morrison's aviation support, many of whom will now be stood down by Qantas without pay, without any plan from the government, and as how to, and any plan on how to put food on the table. It just happens that the same workers that have been abandoned by the Morrison government have also been illegally abandoned by Qantas. The federal court on Friday found that the Qantas had broken the law when it outsourced 2,000 ground handling jobs last year. It was a massive victory for those 2,000 essential workers and the Transport Workers Union. But how does the Morrison respond to the decision? It turns around and cuts ground staff out of the aviation support package. So who is really calling the shots in this country when it comes to aviation? Alan Joyce received $2 billion from the Prime Minister. We asked for it, he gets it. Alan Joyce asked for that money not to be no strings attached so that he can outsource 2,500 jobs. And the Prime Minister gives that to him. The vindictive Alan Joyce wants to take revenge on those workers for beating him in court. And the Prime Minister cuts them out of the aviation support package. How's that for the spirit of Australia? Quite clearly, we've seen a number of examples of the horrific nature of uh, what's been happening with this rollout. We see less than 5% of home care workers now covered by, um, by uh, vaccinations. And of course, the government's response is, it's not a focus. Well, 85% of our aged are supported by home care workers. It's another failing by this government because it has not got the vaccinations in place. It's not a race. Order, Senator I'll put difference. the motion moved by Senator Watt. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll take it. Senator McKim, you have moved the motion to take note of the answer to the question asked by Senator Seawitt and call Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I take note of the answer from the Minister, from Minister Colbeck to my questions around the Doherty modelling around vaccinations. Uh, rates and the transition, the uh, how it relates to the phases of transition out of um, the current situation. I was extremely disappointed in the minister's answer for a number of reasons. He, the government clearly, or he himself, had not him, equated himself with uh, the Grattan Institute report, which is uh, very important to this discussion. We know that shifting from an effective strategy of zero community transmission to one of removing restrictions and opening up our borders are based on high levels of vaccination. It has to be one of the most important and is one of the most important decisions that this country will make. To set too low targets, which risk surging hospitalizations and deaths of thousands of people will, is deeply concerning. And we need to make sure that we are properly basing our decisions on scientific modelling that needs to be used to inform our target decisions. And what the government's done and what the minister was basically saying in answer to uh, my questions was the Doherty Institute has done the modelling and that's it. Well, the Grattan Institute has done some modelling too, and I'm sure other institutes have as well. How about we look at that? The Doherty Institute uh, modelling 
is based on ages above the, those that are currently um, eligible for vaccinations, above the ages of 16, for example. Now, if you look at, compare the, compare the two uh, predict, uh, models, Grattan suggests that a vaccination target of 80% of the whole population, in other words, from children 12 up, is necessary to avoid overwhelming the health system and also uh, stopping infections and uh, deaths. Now, if you look at their modelling, the 80% the government's now using, or National Cabinet's decided on, it based on over 16, is actually a population target of 65%. If you then go to looking at the 70%, as I said in my, or asked in my question to the minister, it that actually relates to 56% of the pop, of the entire population. If you include children over the age of 12. So my question then to the minister was, well, why aren't you including them? His answer was, we're including the some that are children that are now vulnerable, uh, eligible, which is good, but it's not that population, not just the uh, vulnerable children that need to be vaccinated to make sure that we are not opening Australia up to uh, wildly uh, optimistic targets, which uh, will then risk our health system and most importantly risk people's lives increase the number of deaths that occur but also we need to remember the issue around long COVID. so even if you some people thought we should accept some people catching COVID, nearly a million people under a 50 percent scenario are predicted to catch COVID. you've got not only does that have a very uh, large impact obviously on our health system but it risks a lot of people having long COVID. We've seen from the outbreaks in New South Wales and in Queensland that children who are now catching the Delta variant. They are transmitting the Delta variant. It is very important that we are vaccinating and ensuring that we have targets that are actually will ensure that we can get to the point where we can safely transition out. The Doherty Institute uh, modelling also does not talk about issues around getting to the point where we uh, fully open our international borders, which the Grattan Institute does. Now, I think the government needs to be ensuring that they are fully taking into consideration all of the modelling that is occurring. Have a good look at the Grattan Institute uh, modelling. I can't believe that the minister had not looked at alternative modelling to ensure that we are making sure that these decisions, which I think we all agree, are some of the most important that, that a government and a parliament will make in terms of how we transition out of uh, both lockdowns, but how we transition to what people um, regard as normal. Order, More Senator Seward. I'll put the motion now by Senator McKim. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices?